Okay, well, good uh, afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are when you're watching the show. This is another episode of Friends of Publius. Don't touch that dial. Don't change that channel. Don't adjust your camera. I am indeed not James David Richmond. Uh, if I might quote the eminent philosophers Cheech and Chong, Dave's not here. That's right. Uh, he's out today, but uh, I'm Kevin Fox, K Fox to my friends, sitting in just to give the uh, friends of uh, Publius a little hand to uh, work through this, uh, this question for Unit 5, National Number 3, dealing with the Fourth Amendment and the issue of privacy. Uh, I'm coming in from uh, sunny, not so sunny Southern California, Arcadia High School, and I'm just happy to be here and join the gang for a day. And uh, we hope to, uh, to uh, if we don't confuse you, make you a little smarter. So, right, we're in uh, the middle of March. March Madness is uh, fully underway, and uh, props to Furman, uh, great little southern school, a little upset there earlier in the week. And I'm excited about the World Baseball Classic coming up uh, Tuesday night, the finals. Will Team USA be able to repeat and remain the champions of the world? And then the Dodgers can win the Western Division again. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Today's uh, topic is really about privacy, or privacy, as our British friends might say. And the core of the Fourth Amendment and the focus of today's conversation. Uh, what on earth would the founders, framers think about privacy in our time? With almost everyone posting almost everything all at once, all the time, through social media platforms I've never even heard of. Uh, who could say that anyone should have an, any expectation of privacy? Well, we're going to delve into that, uh, that big concept today and uh, get started. Seems like the normal routine is to throw it out to the whole crew. With a general question, gentlemen, uh, first off, any general thoughts or questions or concerns that come to mind uh, that you think students and teachers need to be thinking about when they start tackle this question? Well, I, I guess I'll start. I, I think uh, when I first saw uh, the question, um, it uh, I, I think, well, maybe this is the historian in me. Um, I thought, wow, I, I think this is primarily a uh, presentism question where it'll, uh, it'll all be primarily be post um, early 20th century. But I guess I'm going to put my plug in. My initial response is, hey, where's the history? So students, don't don't lose the history. Uh, there is, a, 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 as I hopefully we'll talk about, uh, a British and colonial background to this. So and it might inform some of the ways in which the 20th century idea of privacy has evolved. So don't lose the history would be my first, um, my first thought. Great. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll push back already because I think there's a, I think there's a lot of history in this question. I think this is a, it's kind of a scaffolded question, even though it's dealing with something very modern in that concept of the fusion centers and national security, it still goes at the heart of where, you know, where's the government allowed to be? And how do we get to this point? I think for students to build a good argument, they have to, to, to build that argument on the basis of our history and, and the British history as well. I think this is a really broad topic. Uh, there's a lot of places, a lot of different directions kids can go with this. Um, I would think about uh, making sure uh, on your panel too, and, and maybe this is the same comment I'll make at the end of the program, but making sure you're looking at uh, both sides of this coin, if you will. Because the whole nature, you know, the whole nature of this uh, question, as well as really the whole idea of this this program, is um, how far can the government go in curtailing our rights or protecting us, uh, and how far do our individual rights go? So I think this is a make sure you're looking at uh, both sides of this argument in terms of government power as well as individual rights. Yeah, I'd agree with all that. I I agree. We need some history. I would caution students, I know there's one bullet on the Fourth Amendment, but this shouldn't turn into just like a list of Fourth Amendment cases. I think we're going to talk about some cases and the Supreme Court has an important role to play, but I think this is broader than that. Um, and also, I mean, I can do this at the same time. I can say, yes, history is important, but I think some of the issues also are issues that students have actually lived through, um, thinking about the COVID experience and states and the national government declaring different types of emergencies and schools shutting down and and, and the, the limitation of rights. I think that I think that is something in your lived experience as students that you actually could have some comments on that I think would be really good for the judges to hear. Yeah, excellent. It is it is a broad question for sure. And I think it has a lot to offer. And, and Tim, speaking of history, 
you know, we are dealing with, the, you know, to a large extent, the Fourth Amendment and how far the government can delve into the private nooks and crannies of our lives. What were the historical events that led to the Fourth Amendment structure? And were these events rooted more in British history and constitutionalism, or were they more uh, a response and a, and a product of colonial experiences uh, amongst the North American colonists? Well, uh, holy cow, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> in 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, well, uh, you obviously haven't been watching too many of these because I can't get anything done in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, I think the, the answer is a little, a little bit of both, uh, or, or actually a lot of both. Uh, there's a deep British history on this, and um, I mean, going back to, um, I mean, there's an element of this even in Magna Carta, but I think ground zero for a lot of the British history piece is Sir Edmund Cook. Uh, I mean, they, um, he spent some time in jail because of some search, and while he's in jail, they search through his papers, and so in the Petition of Right, I think predictably there's this there's this claim that um, there, uh, there's this this notion that there should be some procedures. Um, but I think in the colonial context, um, there's three big cases, and, and all of them are in the 1760s. Uh, well, actually, let me back up. Before that, a lot in the in the uh, Navigation Acts in the 1660s, and there was another one in the 1690s. There were provisions in there that, that allowed for um, uh, customs inspector um, officials to inspect, you know, docks and warehouses and ships and stuff. And and the colonials had, uh, you know, had a pretty visceral response to that. So coming out of the Navigation Acts, even in the 17th century, there's this uh, these claims of invasions of of, of people's uh, places and and uh, making privacy claims. But the the big colonial, uh, there's three of them in the 1760s, and, and most notably the um, Wilkes, the Wilkes case, but uh, the other ones are Antic. We'll put these in the resources. Uh, uh, Wilkes and then Leach, all of them um, favored in uh, were in favor of the person whose stuff had been searched uh, and in violation of British common law. Uh, so all that to say is that there's a big long. I, I'd forgotten how I looked into this today in preparation. I've forgotten how long a train of a British tradition in the common law there was uh, coming out of this claim origins of this castle doctrine. Um, so there's there's uh, the colonial experience is, is very, um, very much in the minds of those who would eventually be involved in writing, writing the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I mean, there's a lot more that could be said um, about state constitutions. I think eight out of the 13 have statements about um, search and seizure, as well as the uh, the criteria under which searches can can take place. So it's very much on the minds of, of the American framers of the Constitution. Tim, to what extent was were, do you think some of those colonial complaints were, well, they don't want to get searched because they were doing things against the law? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? Is this what really is? Uh, in privacy yeah, I mean, this law? Yeah, smuggling is is kind of the, <laughs> the original uh, gripe that colonials had. That I guess they felt it free to uh, to smuggle and, and didn't want to be messed with. So there is a disingenuous just disingenuousness uh, about a lot of the colonial claims um, because they're smuggling and and they don't want their their stuff searched through. So yeah. Yeah, we'll have to sort of grapple with that as we go forward in terms of when when does the government need that power uh, in order to sustained liberal, you know, well, ordered liberty. One more thing about British uh, background, they, there were these two exceptions in the British tradition. Uh, if you were, uh, I mean, today, I think you call it hot pursuit, uh, mm -hmm. but the British kind of had their own version of that. They, if there was a known felon uh, that they could invade somebody's home, um, or if there was it, it, this vague exception uh, to, to, uh, to proceed with searches, and it was called, uh, if there was a breach of the peace. <laughs> So even in British common law, there were these two exceptions that I think are interesting and may students might want to track through on how that evolves in terminology uh, into our system. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll step back now at this point. So because I mean, I, 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 I could go on forever on this, but. Well, let's let's turn the clock forward a few centuries. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, from what sources did the Supreme Court ultimately come to establish a right to privacy? 
um, given that you know at least the word didn't exist and and the concept to some extent uh, as it as we expect it today wasn't there during the founding period well um before before i tackle that i want to throw one more case in there that was uh siemens case s-e-m-a-y-n-e -E yeah. apostrophe s uh tim alluded to sir edward cook uh spelled c-o-k-e uh, we'll have a link in the resources to it but this is where uh, in 1604, Cook will establish the Castle Doctrine with some great language, just, you know, some great language out of that case and about a man's shack and it may, the wind may whistle through it or whatever, it may be pretty poor, but there's certain places the king does not belong. So I think that really helps establish that. And actually, if you want to, if, if for students dealing more with Fourth Amendment issues, um, knock and announce. We, we, we talked about no knock warrants uh, have been in the news recently, but knock and announce actually can go all the way back to that Siemens case. So mm -hmm. I think that's uh, for the students that, to, to go all the way back to that, because that really is a, a foundational piece for us. In terms of the court, uh, the, the modern Supreme Court, well, I guess everybody will start with Griswold uh, v. Connecticut, uh, the 1965 case uh, that was actually kind of a kind of a setup case, honestly, in terms of uh, the uh, state of Connecticut uh, not allowing a, a Planned Parenthood to disseminate birth control information uh, to married couples. Um, and uh, they, the court, in that opinion, used the, the first, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the ninth, and the 14th. And this is where we get the, uh, is this where we get the famous penumbras and emanations, right? Mm -hmm. the, the whole idea that, uh, well, through these emanations or these penumbras of these other amendments, yes, there is a right to privacy. Uh, I know that um, certain justices, I, I think Justice Thomas is one of them that does not believe the right to privacy exists because it's not in the original language. But I would argue that uh, the framers of the Constitution, as well as the Bill of Rights, uh, believe that there was a right to privacy. So starting with Griswold, uh, which is the first modern actual the first attempt by the, the court to establish this right to privacy um and since then it's you know moved forward and, and backward and the line you know has gone back and forth but that's really the the beginnings of the court trying to establish a right to privacy or as uh, i love justice brandeis uh the right to be let alone which uh he uses in olmstead uh olmstead is a case from the 1920s but it's actually based on a uh, law Review article that he did for Harvard Law Review in 1890, which has got some fascinating language. In, and I was looking through it today, and oh my goodness, um, I would encourage students to. Um, I'm going to put there's a, be a link and resources to this, but um, the language from this 1890 Law Review is talking about this modern technology of the day and how it could change everything. And he's talking about the ability to take photographs. And, but the language could absolutely apply uh, to the, the, the root of this question about technology. So, um, so that idea of a right to be let alone, the right to privacy, I think is one that's ingrained in us uh, from our very inception as Tim alluded to, and even to our British heritage, but in terms of actually the Supreme Court Griswold, all right. Uh, so over to I, Mike. I had, uh, I had a question oh, oh, uh, Tim. Uh, for Chris, I think for Chris, I had read years ago and I never really looked into this, but I thought somebody made the argument um, that there were these other cases, because you mentioned the 20s, that there were these two, uh, I think they were school cases. One was like a language case, um, Myers maybe. And the other one was a, a private school case, and it, it it was it almost was like a parent's right to privacy to choose um, choose education. Um, do do you agree with that? That those that because uh, you started with Griswold, which was, uh, wasn't wasn't Myers though dealing with the German language? The ability, right. that, yeah, yeah. yeah um, I'm not yeah. sure if I would. I'm not sure if if I, I don't know that that would that would fall under that idea of a right to privacy. I think it's, that's uh, more of an individual right for, uh, you know, uh, parents and under education. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not sure that it that would fall in, in okay. the realm of privacy. In the other case, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know enough about the other case, Tim, to, to, to um, I think it was, might've been uh, 
something society of sisters i think or uh pierce pierce oh uh, pierce uh, yeah yeah i think um, it was a similar thing that uh maybe parent parental right to choose an education or um but i just well, i just remember reading that years ago and i didn't know whether that was a a decent basis to get from that to griswold i i don't know i don't i um i don't know that uh that the court uses that in their opinions um but it makes me think of um, FERPA, uh, Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, as yeah, well as yeah. HIPAA. So there are there is legislation that's uh, been written to protect uh, um, students as well as parents and and uh, their right to privacy as well as uh, your right to medical privacy, uh, your medical record. Um, so, but I'm not sure. I'd have to. I I don't know. Tim is okay. my best answer. Yeah, lot, lots of uh, lots of leeway in there to sort of play around with that idea. So, um, Mike, uh, as we're now, uh, if you're awake, uh, you're seeing tons of reporting and stories about the 20th anniversary of the war in Iraq, and lots of people are asking some really tough questions and wondering, we maybe crossed some lines um, back in the day, and, and have we learned anything from that experience? And so, should governmental power be on a sliding scale when it comes to national emergencies like war, economic crises, bank fund runs, or a pandemic? In other words, should the government have more power during emergencies to curtail or restrict individuals' rights in order to keep us safe? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I like the idea of a sliding scale. I, I do think that that is what the, not only that the framers intended, I think it's just good governance that in times of emergency, Maybe maybe the powers do have to increase a little bit, um, but it's really not a should question. I mean, because it's occurring right now, um, and just doing a little bit of research for this question, I learned some facts that I, I just didn't know. Um, you know, in 1976, we passed. Well, I knew, I knew this. We passed the National Emergencies Act, right? Congress finally stepped in and said, "We got to give some direction to the president." Because before that, presidents were declaring national emergencies all the time and just doing what they wanted. So they passed this act, um, which gives the president or the executive branch 136 specific powers that it can use under certain um, in certain ways. And I was um, shocked to learn that there are 30 of these that are still in effect right now. Um, the longest running was that um, President Carter used this act to um, put sanctions on Iranian assets, to freeze Iranian assets during the hostage crisis. And that state of emergency has never been lifted. So it's still in effect today, as well as 29 others. So I learned that all presidents are doing this. Um, every president since Carter has used the National Emergency Act. Um, Clinton and Obama are the two that used it the most in terms of just the number of times. Um, so, so it is being used, and I think there's there's justification um, for it being used. The, the The tricky question, it seems to me, is um, can we all agree about what justifies an emergency? And and I don't want to get into the the Supreme Court stuff here because I'm not I'm not really ready to have that discussion. But um, I'm sure Chris or some of you can. But I mean, it's when it's when the Supreme Court comes in and starts trying to decide for itself whether there's an emergency and, or, or just letting Congress kind of have that have that sort of discretion. And then to what extent um, is there a time limit on this? Um, most other countries in the world have a constitutional provision relating to emergency powers, like over 90 percent. And uh, and we don't. Right. So all this is kind of left either to legislation or to just different political actors sort of pushing themselves as far as they can go until someone pushes back. So should it be done? Yes. Is it happening? Yes. Um, what are those limits, though, I think is kind of the ongoing question. And that's something that in the context of whether it's 9-11, the Iraq war or COVID, those are the discussions that I think most citizens are interested in. What are the limits when the government is going to declare these powers? Well, it makes Mike. That makes me think of uh, just. I, I know this is not about necessarily about executive power, but uh, this makes me think of Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, and I and I know Justice Jackson's opinion was not the controlling opinion, 
but uh, I love you know, part of his concurrence uh, that if you grant that the president has emergency power, the president's going to be finding emergencies all the time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And what's and what's interesting? I just want to add. I was thinking about the right to privacy and how you know what, whatever the court did in Griswold, other cases where they found a principle based on other principles, right? And that some justices just they want to see it in text. You could make the same argument for a lot of executive power, right? And what I think a lot of other justices do is they'll use, they won't call it a penumbra, but they'll find certain principles and weave those together to allow for the president to have certain actions or the executive branch when it's not stated plainly as well, right? Um, so I just, I just found out, I hadn't thought about it, that kind of uh, comparison between the way privacy where we have to justify it in a way where I don't know if we have to justify executive power to the same extent, you know what I mean? Well, and, uh, to make to make Tim happy, I'll give you uh, students a little historical illusion, and, and, and that's Hobbes and, and the Leviathan, right? And what's, what's he say? That we, we fear the violent death at the hands of another. So according to Hobbes, we're willing to give power to the king to keep us safe order um you think about uh the terrorist attacks on 9 11 the passing of the patriot act uh students might want to check out section 215 of the patriot act uh which is gave you the government broad power to collect data to keep us safe so you know the whole idea it goes back to uh, the idea to give the government power to keep us safe and mike alluded to this when the emergency or whatever the threat when it passes we would like to think that in that sliding scale idea that the government power would retreat back to its original position but we know that rarely does that happen i mean that and that was a part of the original um i mean the framing they this idea of general warrants were so open-ended uh that they wanted to you know create some parameters to limit those general warrants so um and, and, and in fact, in the in the in in the in, in Britain itself, general warrants were were a problem. So the colonials they saw general warrants as assuming that they're equal status with Tim. their brethren. Uh, the general warrants were a problem, uh, too way too open ended. So the, I mean, they they would they would look at it as <laughs> the sliding scale. There is no sliding scale. Would, would you think that? um these fusion centers which is kind of at the the basis for part of this question would you compare the fusion centers that exist throughout the country um like a general warrant um or no well uh well i don't know i hadn't thought about that um i guess data collection is one thing how you're going to use it's another i mean i i would draw uh a, a link between fusion centers and these committees of safety during the American Revolution actually mm -hmm. this these this cooperation because I'm the what little I know directly about fusion centers I see this as a government cooperating with private entities there's an element of private entity cooperating with government in in collecting and housing data uh, and I think the the committees of safety cooperated with their local counties and sometimes state legislatures during the revolution collecting information on people that weren't patriotic enough. So uh, I would say um, for, for me, I would see the committees of safety as a better correlation, at least for me. I hadn't thought about the general warrant thing. Well, just the idea that, I mean, I think of like post 9-11, uh, you know, the, the broad power of the government now to get up in our business, so to speak, and, yeah. and not even to tell us when they're when they're doing it. As a matter of fact, part of the law would forbid uh, the library to, to to tell me that, hey, by the way, the feds came by that they wanted to see what you've been checking out or my banker to say, hey, the, the feds uh, look through your records. Uh, so I don't know. It's just uh, it seems to me as, uh, as a some might consider it a very large fishing fishing expedition. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. A lot of challenges there. Uh, and ask uh, what Snowden, see what he thinks about it. Um, so, oh, oh boy <laughs> tim uh can you think of times or examples whether it be pre-technological advances even pre uh, photography or within maybe even more modern technology where the u.s government has exercised perhaps too much 
or too little power in order to provide security. Well, I, I guess I've kind of uh, shot myself in the foot already. I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, the revolutionary period uh, had all kinds of spies uh, that were, I mean, these are private individuals cooperating with quasi government entities. I mean, Washington had a, a spy ring in and around New York City. Um, there were, uh, yeah, interestingly enough, there were some uh, African Americans who posed as runaway slaves that that would, uh, you know, circulate in in British camps and gather information and pass it back along. To, so, so during the revolution, there's a lot of cooperation between private individuals and government entities. Oh, these, uh, I was looking at New York today. They create this, uh, well, no, actually the National uh, Con Continental Congress creates this, it's called the Committee to Detect and Defeat Conspiracies. Oh. And, and uh, they actually put John Jay in charge of this, uh, which, which I did not know. But essentially, it's basically, uh, let's go around and find people, and this is connected to the committees of safety idea that I, I've already mentioned. Let's go around to five people that are violating the, uh, the, uh, the association bill in 75. Let's find people that are trying to, um, you know, violate the boycotts. Let's find people that are, aren't patriotic enough, who... Uh, pastors who aren't, uh, you know, preaching the patriot cause from this, uh, from the pulpit. Uh, so New York has has some pretty, what we would consider pretty draconian uh, cooperation amongst regular citizens to, to report those who aren't sufficiently patriotic or not, you know, uh, or are outright loyalists. Uh, so, so I think the revolution is is uh, is important. I think. Um, I think, you know, there's also something to be said to investigate in uh, civil war. Uh, Pinkerton, of, of all people, Alan Pinkerton um, worked for Lincoln. I mean, he wasn't particularly effective in, in, uh, in gathering espionage. It, it was, um, he wasn't particularly great at it. But, I mean, he certainly becomes great later uh, when he, has, he creates an organization that's quite comfortable in working with corporations and governments. Uh, during the period where unions are perceived as a threat to to American stability, uh, but Pinkerton gets it cuts his teeth uh, on cooperating with the government, or or the, the government seeking to cooperate with individuals finding uh, those unpatriotic or unsavory elements uh, during during the war. So I, I think wartime for students might be a great. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff in World War One and World War Two. Uh, so so I think wartime is is a great scenario for students to look into this this idea of spying and data collecting um you know putting your eye on people that that aren't quite as uh, uh patriotic or or whatever you want out of them uh, that they're in the crosshairs yeah i think uh the, I, I i can't help but think of pinkerton without thinking about the homestead strike right? yeah now right. like being able to go out and hire your own private army to put down a strike yeah, I was talking to my uh, one of my classes today about Schenck, and what I raised the question is, do you think he would have had as much pushback if he had he not been a member of the Socialist Party? <laughs> uh, and so, you know, sometimes these these perceived enemies are convenient because you can sort of attack the unpopular uh, or the unliked, yeah, yeah. and so it's, it's risky, yeah. it's dangerous uh, for sure. Well, the the stuff out of the, the Espionage Act, the Espionage and Sedition Act in World War One, as I'm sure you guys are familiar, holy smokes. You could be sitting on the subway and you could be talking to the guy next to you going, man, I'm just this rationing or this, I'm not sure about this war. And you can, you can say some things that you're just sitting there, you know, you're talking to some dude on the subway or on the bus and someone overhears it and they report you. Yeah. You know, I mean, holy cow. It, it was, it was, uh, you know, fear is a, fear is a powerful motivator. Yeah, it is. C Hobbs. C Hobbs. <laughs> was it <laughs> Was it one of you, and we'll put this in the resources, um, Hostile's new book, America's Midnight? Did one of you recommend that? It's it's all about um, it's all about the domestic emergency wartime powers that Wilson did um, both before and after World War One, but during that period. So he goes in the depth about yeah to, to the point that it mattered that Schenck was part of the Socialist Party and. <laughs> 
and it wasn't just the socialists, right? It was it was a lot of other groups. Uh, Black Americans suffered under those uh, acts after World War Two, World War One. So we'll put I'll put a link to that book. It's a it's a great longer kind of account of to what America was doing about a hundred years ago. In the revolution, it was the Quakers that were in the crosshairs yeah. as radicals. Um, because you know, because they're, they're they're pacifism uh, in New York and Pennsylvania, definitely, they uh, they ran afoul of some of these committees of, of safety. Radical pacifism, I like it. Radical okay. pacifists. Yes. <laughs> T-shirts for everybody. All right. So, hey, Mike, uh, going back to something you mentioned earlier, and sort of maybe you can build on that a little bit because you did reference the what ninety percent of the countries in the world have some kind of uh, limits on emergency powers. How have other countries' security services balanced? individual rights versus promoting security uh, and the common good. Yeah. I just want to note for the viewers that, you know, given we're talking about privacy and national security, that's why I'm constantly in the shadows this episode. I'm trying to like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm trying to find a place to go where I, I'm not in the shadows. Um, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's some debate amongst legal scholars that whether the United States Constitution actually does say something about emergency powers. I, my reading is it doesn't, right? So that means that there are 90% of country constitutions in the world where there's a specific provision that says when an emergency can be declared, by whom, how long, different types of emergencies based on different types of um, um, things that would happen. So to answer your question, it seems to me like it's kind of a three-step process in terms of getting control of these emergencies. One, we have to know the government is doing it. And I think having it in the constitution helps with that, right? I mean, the fact that we're under 30 states of emergency right now, um, that probably most of us watching this didn't know, that's that's problematic, right? I'm a little so, nervous, actually. Yeah, yeah. Right? 30. <laughs> and then you gotta know it and then it's the job of the courts to intervene and to tell other political actors where that balance is, right? And, you know, different countries have different strengths in doing this, I think. Um, and then the executive branch or legislative branch has to answer to, to those governments. So to me, the fact that most, most other countries have it in their constitutions is an important first step just in terms of public awareness to get the things moving. Right, where you could have a better a better kind of balance here. Um, I did find I did find this bit of information interesting. It's from the, um, the Institute for Democracy and Electoral Electoral Assistance, and I'll put it in the resources. Um, they 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 looked at the number of countries that declared an emergency during COVID. Right. So either through the constitutional provisions or just through legislative acts. And what they found was that um, if you were a, what they called a highly functioning democracy, so what we might consider the freest countries in the world, less than half of those countries declared an emergency and less than half of authoritarian regimes declared an emergency. It was the countries in the middle, the countries who are kind of weak democracies they were, they were like 70% of them declared emergencies. So the report goes on to kind of speculate, well, maybe in authoritarian governments, authoritarian leaders don't, don't need to declare an emergency because they're doing stuff anyways. And maybe in a democracy, there's just, there's more debate that has to happen. Maybe there's just harder to get done because of the checks and balances. And then maybe in these weaker democracies, maybe it's just a convenient way for leaders to get other things done. I mean, we saw that after 9-11, right? We saw most of countries adopt Patriot Act like pieces of legislation and then just used it against their, their political opponents. So um, I do think there's, um, I mean, I'm always thinking that from a comparative perspective, you can learn a lot, right? And you can make some different sort of judgments based on that. So I'd encourage the students to, to think about what other countries are doing and also think about the United States and its 50 state constitutions. And maybe for this question, if you come ready, like knowing what your state constitution says in terms of state emergencies, because that's a whole separate thing. That might be a really another interesting comparative perspective um, that wouldn't mean that students have to go outside of outside of the United States. 
that's a that's Mike. That's a great point about states because governors have enacted emergency powers far more often than than presidents have. Yeah, I think and one of the things I think interesting is tangentially related is uh, the arguments, the more modern arguments that sometimes through these emergencies, the president has to act quickly, right? So we have to be able to give that president power to act quickly, um, see the Gulf of Tonkin resolution or the uh, uh, authorization for the use of military force under President Bush after the 9-11 attacks, otherwise known as the AUMF. Um, but I always think of, uh, you know, when we were bombed at Pearl Harbor by the Japanese on December 7th, 1941, we were able to get a declaration of war on December 8th, and that was 1941. And modes of travel were not nearly as convenient as they are today. So um, I, I just I think that some of that that argument that sometimes the president has to act quickly and Congress is too slow. Which yes, yeah, if you've seen this program, you know that Congress is not my friend. Um, but we were able to do it very rapidly. I think. You know, FDR giving his famous address to Congress asking for a declaration of war, and they grant it the day after. So um, I don't know sure if that's a, that argument about speed uh, holds up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, well, Chris, since you're going, let's uh, let's throw one more at you. Uh, the last bullet of the question implies, or, or perhaps the Fourth Amendment might need some type of revision to reflect our modern technological world. Would you agree with this assessment? And if so, what changes might you suggest? Wow, um, 232 years ago, right? Is that is that is my math right, Tim? Is my is that right? Is that, is that uh, I'm. I was told there would be no math. <laughs> I think it's 232 years ago the Bill of Rights is ratified, and if you think about it, um, here we are. We have this document, uh, the Fourth Amendment, to be secured in one's houses, persons, papers, and effects, right? And, and there's no way that, that these guys thought about things like this, you know, cell phones. And the fact that that, that law or that right, excuse me, um, that amendment has been interpreted through the ages uh, to try and take into the idea of modern technology. I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure to answer the question. I, I don't know that it does. I don't know that it does because I think that what the courts have been able to do through time is to be able to interpret that and they've been able to create zones of privacy. Uh, they've been able to say to the government, no, this is an overreach on your part. Um, uh, the, the Riley versus California case, I think is a, is a big one uh, for students to take a look at. I think that'll be in the links as well. Um, so, you know, third third party exceptions. The court has been able to carve out exceptions for third parties, and that means students. Um, so, if I'm going to be doing my banking online, you know, I'm sharing my information with the phone company, whoever my provider is. Um, so, they've been able to to, to do it that way. So, um, I don't think so. Now, I could be persuaded. Uh, I could be persuaded that it does need to be updated because there's no way in heck. These guys anticipated this crazy modern technology, like uh, like Brandeis referred to in, in photographs. Uh, but we've been able to adapt it and change it over time to still, I think, provide protections for individuals to limit the power of the government, and yet still give government power when the courts have thought they needed it. Now, have I agreed with every court decision in terms of limiting government power? No. But I think the Fourth Amendment has still, still, you know, served it well. But that doesn't mean that, boy, there's someone way smarter than me can make a better argument for updating it. I, this this is kind of creepy to me because I think there's two weeks in a row that I'm agreeing, I'm agreeing with Chris. Um, <laughs> so I have to rethink my whole, uh, you know, my whole paradigm here. But uh, <laughs> I think I think Chris's point's well taken that the phrasing uh is a, is good enough and then subsequent interpretation i mean madison does something interesting uh he in the list of things that uh, people should be secure in he uses the word persons mm -hmm. now that uh i think that's an invitation for interpretation i mean um persons is that does that mean uh my uh 
I mean, this this space around me. Uh, yeah. So I think the word persons is interesting. And I think that's an invitation, a, a legitimate invitation for courts to eventually interpret that. I also think the Congress did something interesting in the creation of the Fourth Amendment, because Madison originally said persons, papers, um, and other property. Uh, that got changed to effects. Now, I think that's a, uh, an, at a minimum, that's an interesting switch. But I also think it's important to think about, OK, what does that mean? And I think there's another invitation to Chris's point, subsequent interpretation, because because maybe this is an effect, an effect. So I, I think Congress may have done something fundamentally important in changing Madison's wording to effects, uh, whereas I'll give him credit for a broad term uh, persons. Um, so, so I think the the interpretation piece of that Chris is making uh point he's making is absolutely poor I I I, I don't know I mean tinkering with the words of the Constitution is always problematic so I guess it's easier to to either agree or disagree with court decisions that's well, a lot more fun <laughs> yeah and it, and it seems to me like the the principles as I've learned them and understanding the Fourth Amendment they're principles that can handle new technology right right the, the, the issue is why is it why isn't Congress doing a better job to update the legislative framework to this new reality? And then and then it would be sort of a then it would open up new areas, right? Like um, given a new legislative framework that the court can then interpret, would that open up some issues that maybe we think ah the Fourth Amendment maybe does need to change for whatever reason? But I don't think we're going to know that until I mean the last time. Congress passed anything relating to technology around this was what 1996 was that right under Clinton the communications um, decency was it yeah I, I mean I mean they might have tinkered with it but yeah I think it's more Congress should step in and then we can see how these this new reality is going to get interpreted but Mike you're expecting Congress to do something I am Chris at some point democracies either have to perform or they're going to fail i think is the lesson i mean well, it, you know you know we're in a race with climate change i, I don't know what's going to happen first but <laughs> it, it, this is not a this is i mean yeah but seriously this is not a state that can go on indefinitely without there being um some serious like pushback like the, Representatives are there to govern, and to the extent that they don't do that, Democrats and Republicans cycle after cycle, and we have these big issues, technology, climate change, looming over us, right? We're all living with it now. Um, I, I think I think there's going to be a real pressure coming in the next decade or so that Congress needs, needs to do something on this, or, or yeah. Well, that, that's a good transition to the next question I want to raise, and, and it, it, it's problematic. But right, so we know a constitution is a framework of government, and the and the 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 you know the delegation enumeration of powers to these temporary office holders, and then the Bill of Rights limiting government, right? And this whole tension between individual versus governmental power. But, but what about like private industry, and particularly big tech? Right, when it comes to our privacy rights, uh, do individuals own their data? Um, or do online platforms own our data? And what future challenges might that pose for us? Um, I think that's a. I think that is the next one of the, one of the next battlegrounds of rights and rights claims. Who owns? Who owns? So if I if I tweet something out, um, who owns that tweet? Is that owned by Elon Musk now and Twitter? Or is that my tweet? And there's merely the platform. Same thing is true with other, you know, uh, whether it be Meta and Facebook or Instagram or whatever, uh, whatever. And I think that, and not only that, um, thinking about the issue we're in now with TikTok, uh, the government pushing back on TikTok and trying to push on them to give up, uh, to try and sell the company to not a, a, a Chinese-owned company. Um, I, that's a. I think that's a really tough area in terms of that because um, when the internet was started and they created cookies, 
they did that in order to make it easier and more user friendly. And we know in our system that, uh, well, the, the world system, uh, that has been monetized. How can we use cookies, pardon me, to uh, monetize every time, every time someone goes online so they can get, you know, I'm thinking about getting this, you know, new pair of boots. And now every time I go to read uh, some publication online, I get pop-up ads for boots. Um, who owns that data? I, I don't know. And I think that will be, a, I think that's a, that's a coming battleground for the, the, the next few years. Do you think our fears, uh, I mean, we've, uh, we're in a country where we, we inherited this fear of government invading our privacy. Uh, are we miss, are, are we naive to assume that gov, uh, corporations owning my privacy <laughs> is as big of a problem uh it, it seems to me that we might be missing the bigger threat well i don't i don't think people give a shin guard honestly i think because they i mean let's face it um i i, I always just use this joke flappy birds right uh, i always want to play you know uh texas hold them on my phone so i'm going to, to agree to the terms of service do i read the terms of service my goodness no because i just want to play texas hold them right so you think about whatever you agree to, which no one reads certain terms of, well, I shouldn't say no one. Most don't read terms of service because we're not worried about corporate invasion of our rights, which I think is is the issue, Tim, I, and I do, because now that data, every time I go online, we, you know, we all go online, we leave a footprint. Yeah. Who owns those footprints? And how are those footprints going to be used? And I don't know the answers to that. I find it interesting maybe that the very uh, the use of that cookie data, right, our search history is going to undermine the big tech's argument that they're just passive platforms because now they're actually, you know, affirmatively using algorithms designed and you know, very complex algorithms designed to use that data. They're no longer passive, you know, platforms, right? They really are actors. Clearly. And, yeah. And, and that's going to have to be something more grappled. To. And, you know, talking about comparison, we can look at the EU. Uh, the Europeans are way more readily uh, ready to, to take on big tech and to find those limits. Um, I think we're still uh, enamored with the dollar and, and, and my students, at least, they don't, don't think twice. If it's about a company making money, they don't seem to care at all. Uh, when it's government, though, you can be punished, you could be jailed, right? Life, liberty, property and all that. And I think there's a, there's a disconnect. I think you're right, Tim, that uh, maybe we should alert ourselves more to some potential risks, uh, but it'll be interesting over time. All right, that gets us near the end. Oh, I'm sorry, Christian. Have you have you guys seen? Uh, there's a there's a documentary, and I'm gonna I want to uh, mention this for the students to take a look at. It's on Netflix. It's called The Great Hack, hmm. um, and it is a couple years old, several years old, but it deals with uh, a, a gentleman trying to get his data back, the right to his data, his online stuff. So. Um, uh, for students, um, you might want to check that out on Netflix. You might find that intriguing. Um, but yeah, we don't, but your point, Kevin, is, is well made. I think that we don't fear corporates. We don't fear corporations. We fear government. And maybe we should fear corporations. I don't know. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to bring it this, the TikTok idea kind of full circle what we we're talking about earlier. And I know we'll, we'll put this in the resources. It was a daily episode today on TikTok. And you know, the the President Biden is getting very close to declaring, like to say, like he's already banned TikTok from all for all federal employees, right? And the argument is, is that well, this is the national security threat. Because this company under Chinese law, any Chinese company has to give over all information to the Chinese government. So, you know, President Trump started looking into this, and President Biden is kind of continuing and saying, well, it's a national, like 100 million Americans are active on TikTok. That's a third of our population. Theoretically, and I think legally under the Chinese governmental system, access to all that information on those American users. Um, I mean, what kind of, you want to talk about engagement of people? If a president were to ban all Americans from using a platform like TikTok, can you imagine the kind of interest people would all of a sudden take in government, but it kind of comes back to this idea of 
cultural security, this notion of kind of, well, you know it when you see it. Um, and um, maybe not in this administration, but a future administration might have to make a tough call like that in terms of shutting down platforms, which seems utterly und undemocratic and un-American to do it. And the fact that two administrations have been con uh, contemplating this, I just think is really interesting. That'd be that'd be a great way to activate the youth vote, wouldn't it? You want to yeah. see you want to see eighteen to 24, 24 year olds get out and vote? Holy cow! Take away TikTok. You know, it reminds me. Did you? Mike Mullen today was being interviewed about the Iraq War, right? And he asked one thing he would change about about wartime, and he said, "Well." Um, the initial group of soldiers that goes over in a war should be enlisted. After that, we should have a draft. Because he goes, I, I want every American family sitting on a table and thinking about whether this is a good policy. He says, I, he goes, I'm not sure if that's the best response, but we need a response where all Americans feel like they have something, something like to sacrifice in this. And, and we didn't do that during the Iraq war. And he said, he kind of said it just led to the war going on and on and on because it was what a million service people and their families who were being affected. So it's not quite on point, but it's just another way of thinking about what would engage people. A draft would engage people as well. Yep, channeling a little ancient uh, Pericles. Uh, so as usual, the final step oh, is whoa, to- Whoa, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't drop that without explanation, I, Kevin. In uh, the funeral oration, uh, he said that you cannot trust the judgment of any leader who does not have a son uh with which to lose or something like that to paraphrase so yeah we, we we all need to have a skin in the game that's democracy right it needs to be contact sport we all need to have some consequence to the decisions that we make collectively and uh uh that's a tough one for sure as we see that's probably probably a lot better advice than just tell people to go shopping <laughs> well that'll fix the banks right well i'm alluding to the iraq war so Right. So as usual, the final step is any last words of wisdom that you find gentlemen wish to share with students and teachers confronted with these questions. Well, that's okay. a heck of a qualifier if you're putting wisdom on it on on. Uh, on the... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I have no uh, for most of this, I've been over my uh, over my head here with this with this question about, you know, technology and, and uh, case law and, and stuff like that. But uh, so so I'm going to defer to the smarter guys on this. So. Well, I think I think it's probably kind of similar to what I said at the beginning is that this is a such a, a broad, broad um, topic. But it's not really. It really is really simple. I, I, I and, and these guys. I've used this quote before. One of my favorite quotes is uh, from a, a, a letter that, that Madison wrote to Jefferson in October of 1788, and he says it's a melancholy reflection that liberties should be exposed to danger where the government have too much or too little power, and that the line that divides your is so inaccurately defined by experience. In other words, to quote Forrest Gump, stuff happens, and the stuff happens. Uh, the government expands its power to keep us safe, but does that power then go back? 9-11 would be an, an example. The pandemic would be an example. Uh, banking crises could be an example. Um, you know, we want to be safe. We want to be secure, but we also want our individual rights. And it's a really kind of a simple, it's not a simple thing, but it's, it is really about the line. How far should the line go? And I think, again, students, make sure you're able to argue both sides of that line because there are good arguments on both sides. Obviously, you know, 9-11 was a great, uh, a great example, a terrible example, sorry, not a great example, a terrible example of perhaps, uh, you know, information failure. January 6th, the insurgency at the Capitol is another example of uh, perhaps information failure in terms of government gathering information to try and thwart these types of uh, attacks. Uh, so there are arguments to be made on both sides uh, of this. So make sure you're prepared to make those arguments on both sides. Yeah, that's really, that's really good, Chris. Um, I don't know, this is something I mentioned earlier. It just strikes me now as I'm reflecting on the question and this posing national security vis-a-vis -vis privacy 
these are both concepts that are super important to our politics and to the constitutional law, but they're both not, either one of these are technically in the constitution. I mean, we're, the question is rooted in the fourth amendment, which is where it should be, right? But it's just interesting to me, like, that the court is drawing lines between these two things of which the constitution gives us very little guidance, which means you're gonna have these debates over penumbras versus in article two executive power. It kind of, it maybe gives the court a little more latitude if they can, if they can work outside of, on these issues. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just struck by how these two things are not in the constitution per se. It, it, I'm, I wanna, I'm sorry, I wanna an addendum here. Um, for the students, and I've heard the students say this, I'm sure we've all heard our students say this, is that, well, gosh, I've got nothing to hide. What do I care? Right? Now, if you're not guilty, why would you want to hide certain things? And I think of uh, the risks of assistance and the general warrants. And yeah, were people smuggling? Clearly. Clearly. But as James Otis argues uh, in the risks of assistance yeah. cases in the 1760s, you know, going back to, to Siemens case, there are certainly just they're just places that the government does not belong, and if they're going to put their nose there, they need to have a darn good reason, a compelling state interest to do that. So be careful, students, for the people that say, "Well, if I've got nothing to hide, what do I care if the government searches my stuff?" That is uh, that flies in the face of uh, the founding period. Yeah, and I think I would just recommend to students, teachers, just, just don't lose sight of first principles, right? It, it's, a, it's a constitution establishing a limited government with the desire to create ordered liberty, uh, and somehow in that tension, we exist, and, uh, and that tension is, is real, and it shifts and changes, and uh, we all have to just, uh, just keep on it, and uh, it's been a great pleasure sharing some time with you three gentlemen, and uh, I wish you all well. Uh, go Team America, and will anybody stop Alabama? That's the question. Uh, and, and in honor of uh, our, our, our normal bus driver, Mr. Richmond, peace, love, and yogurt tacos. Bye-bye, bye, 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 bye bonds.